Sutra. Beings who seem to be Shramanas but in their minds are not Shramanas, who destroy the things of the eternally dwelling, who deceive lay people, who go against the precepts, and who commit many other evil deeds, will fall into the relentless hell, where for thousands of billions of ends they will seek escape in vain. Commentary There are four kinds of Shramana, the Shramana of the Way of Searches. The Sramana who speaks of the way, the Sramana who leaves the way, the Sramana who defies the way. The first of these refers to the Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas. The second applies to those who explain sutras and preach the Dharma, particularly greatly virtuous monks and arahats who, having borne testimony to the fruition, spend their lives espousing it. The third kind, the Sramana who leaves the way, takes cultivation of the way as his very life. The fourth kind, who are discussed at the Sutra passage cited here, are Sramanas who define the way. Although the word Sramana has four meanings, it can also be explained with three meanings, which are not three at all, but really two, and these two in turn, a really just one, which is to say, Shramana. Ah, how amazing is this Buddha drama! The one meaning is simply Shramana, and that means diligent and cease. Diligent refers to Shramanas who are not lazy, and cease refers to those who are. So, you see, Shramana has two meanings. One points to laziness, the other to vigor. The lazy one says to the diligent, don't bother working, relax and take it easy. The diligent one replies, Don't be so lazy, follow me and cultivate the way. Since there are two sides, there is a battle to see which one will win. The one with greater strength will pull the other over. If the power of the diligent is greater, the lazy side loses. If the power of the lazy is greater, the diligent side losses. So these are the two meanings of the word Shramana, being diligent and ceasing. But I also said that this word has three meanings. How? There are three aspects to both diligence and ceasing. The threefold aspect of the former is the energetic cultivation of morality, samadhi and wisdom. The threefold aspect of the latter is the putting to rest of greed, hatred, and delusion. Morality is the abstinence from evil and carrying out good acts. It means to stop one's own evil conduct and guard against future mistakes. The guides to morality are the precepts. How many moral precepts are there? There are the five precepts. Abstention from killing stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and intoxicants. In addition to this, there are the eight precepts, the ten precepts of Ashramanura, the 250 precepts of the Bhikshus, and the Bodhisattva precepts, which consist of 10 major and 48 minor ones. There are also the 348 precepts of the Bhikshunis, some people say that Vishunis have 500 precepts. Let's not worry too much about this. These days, most receive the 348. Samadhi is developed by meditation. It must be cultivated. Without cultivation, Samadhi cannot be gotten. Why do people meditate? To meditate is to cultivate Samadhi little by little. When you first begin to meditate, you have no samadhi, and your thoughts run off to the heavens and the hells, to the Buddhas and to the Bodhisattvas. In fact, your mind wanders all over the realm of horses, cows, sheep, chickens, dogs, and pigs. You see, your mind does not need a boarding pass. It freely roams in uh, the heavens and hells. It roams about due to a lack of samadhi. We are cultivating now to prevent our minds from running all over, from going east and west and up and down. 
Someone is thinking, why bother cultivating concentration compared it to dancing? You prance and leap about, and it's much more interesting than just sitting there like a stick of wood. What are the advantages of samadhi anyway? It seems so rigid. Basically, it has no advantages. Then why bother with it, you ask? If you wish to reveal your inherent wisdom, you must first of all cultivate samadhi. For if you are not able to concentrate, your thoughts will be scattered about and you will never manifest any wisdom. Wisdom comes from samadhi. If you want to be released from delusion, cultivate samadhi. Now let me introduce someone who said that when meditating, he felt as if he were on the edge of a great precipice, on the edge of a very deep abyss, and was frightened. This is one of the initial indicators of your wanting to develop samadhi. Here, one must be particularly fearless. I will take this opportunity today to talk about it. Didn't I mention this before? If you are meditating and you feel that there is a great slab of iron suspended above your head on the verge of breaking loose, or if you feel a bomb is about to go off, do not be affected by it, because if you are, it will be quite easy to enter the realm of the demons. If you become attached to such signs, the atomic bomb you feel over your head may very well go off. If, on the other hand, you pay no attention to them, demons cannot come near you, and in fact, they will have to run away. The mental state in which a huge crevasse appears while you are in meditation represents your comic obstacles, which are heavier and deeper than the 10,000 foot abyss. Now, you know how heavy your comic obstacles are. It should urge you to cultivate, but do not be fearful. Sometimes, when you are meditating, you may feel blissful, freedom which is so joyful that you forget everything else. This is a state, this is a, a test of dhyana, the most blissful experience in the world of form, which far surpasses connubial pleasures or pleasures from taking intoxicants. It is a state that cannot be described. It is said that only the one who drinks the tea knows whether it is cold or hot. The same is true of the flavor of dhyana. If you have experienced this state, you know what it is like. You can tell what stage or level someone as soon as they describe it. One of my disciples, for example, is about to reach the ground dry from living birds. One of the four dhyanas, this is actually quite common and can occur to anyone who can divide sincerely. That kind of bliss cannot be compared to, and at this point, one is on the verge of leaving afflictions and obtaining bliss. This stage is one form of samadhi. What is the function of wisdom? Someone with wisdom will not go down a wrong road. You are confused because you turn your back on enlightenment and unite with the dust. You mistake suffering for happiness because you are ignorant. One must diligently cultivate morality, samadhi, and wisdom. We do not need to listen to too many sutra lectures, just this one, just this word. Diligence is enough for us to draw upon endlessly. Diligently cultivate morality, diligently cultivate samadhi, diligently cultivate wisdom. We must cultivate, otherwise we do not acquire this. Listen to your master. Also, we must put the rest greed, hatred, and delusion. Did I not say resting is laziness? Laziness is about stopping and resting. But this resting is about putting greed, hatred, and delusion to rest. When greed rests, you are not eager for any materialistic pleasures and others. When hatred rests, you do not get angry. Donate your anger. To whom? To me, to your master. A master needs huge fiery tempers that scare the disciples. The disciples are not afraid of a master as soft as cotton. Hence, they do not cultivate being lazy. 
They are both uh, the various meanings on how Shramana should diligently cultivate precepts, samadhi and wisdom, put to rest and greed, hatred and delusion. There are beings who seem to be Shramanas, but in their minds are not Shramanas. Although they are Samanas in name, they are not Shramanas in their hearts. Not only do they not cultivate morality, samadhi and wisdom, they do not end greed, hatred and delusion. They claim more greed, hatred and delusion are better and best of all forget about morality, samadhi and wisdom. They pretend to be shramanas. This type of shramanas does not practice compassion or patience, the six perfections of all the myriad practices. They purposely avoid doing things that shram shramanas do. What do they do? Destroy the things of the eternally dwelling. Items belonging to the triple drawer, even small ones, cannot be wasted or casually ruined. Even so, it is only a piece of paper added up and one turns into many, even if you damage, damage just a sheet of paper to destroy the things of the eternally dwelling. There is a saying, do not take even a blade of grass or a splinter of wood without permission. Taking without permission is stealing. We cannot take use other people's things without letting the owner know. Otherwise, that would be a theft, a violation of the precept against stealing. If a simple thing as needle and thread is given to you as an offering, it may not be used carelessly and most certainly may not be given away. Even monastics cannot give away goods belonging to the temple to others. You may give away your personal belongings, such as an article of used clothing. Community items, however, even something as minute as a piece of thread, cannot be casually given away to win friends. It is a mistake to gain personal favors so that people will feel obliged to aid and support you. Monastics must pay attention and pay particular attention to this. Destroying the things of the eternally dwelling does not refer only to a large quantity of items, but merely giving away a sheet of paper, a piece of thread, or even a grain of rice based on emotion. Even monastics do not have the right to give away community items, even if it is just a stick of incense. Those who constantly deceive and lie to lay people who go against or violate the precepts such as the five precepts, the ten precepts, the ten major and the forty-eight minor precepts or the two hundred fifty precepts and who commit many other, not just one unimaginable evil deeds will fall into the relentless hell where for thousands of billions of ends they will seek escape in vain. Sutra Beings who steal the wealth of property of the eternally dwelling, including its grains, food and drink and clothing, or who take anything at all that was not given to them, will fall into the relentless hell where for thousands of billions of ends they will seek escape in vain.